Picture your most recent three to 500 mile long trip, maybe from Philadelphia. Maybe you went to Boston or Pittsburgh. How did you travel there? How did you decide to travel there? My name is Megan Ryerson, and I'm a professor of electrical and systems engineering and city and regional planning here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I study how you make intercity travel choices. When I was an undergraduate here at the University of Pennsylvania in systems engineering, I was fascinated by my new ability to optimize the movement of anything along a network, a packet of information along a communications network, or a, an Amazon box along a logistics network. And this love for optimization brought me to the dynamic field of intercity transportation. A question that really motivates me is how will new technologies, everything from wayfinding and navigation technologies or to vehicles that talk to each other and maybe one day will drive themselves, how these technologies will change the way you and I make travel decisions? And how do our individual travel decisions add up to have big influences on how, for example, an airline might supply air service at a city or how a local or a federal government might supply infrastructure to a region. Now, while the engineer in me loves to optimize networks, the urban planner in me is interested in how our travel decisions might influence the environment and air quality and the economic development of cities, regions, and the country. Now, one disclaimer before I begin, which is particularly, re particularly relevant uh, given, the, uh, given the speaker, Hyung Soo uh, Kim, on his uh, amazing device for, uh, for people who are blind. Uh, I'm going to be speaking very freely about making travel choices, but I do realize that not everybody has such freedom. People who are living with disabilities, the elderly, people without the financial resources to have a vehicle or to buy an air ticket may have, may have no such freedom. Now, with all that said, let's go back to picturing your last three to 500 mile trip. You likely decided between driving and flying. Here in the Northeast Corridor, we also have intercity rail. And so rail is a small portion of, of trips when we consider the entire US. So we'll just consider driving and flying for now. And as you were consider, considering your choice of driving or flying, you likely thought of the, the, the entire travel chain of both of the trips. Driving is very straightforward. Get in your car and drive. Right? Flying is a little more complicated. Right? We have the long flight. But we also have to access the airport, go through security. Uh, and, uh, and sort of do that on the other end at our destination as well. Well, while you're evaluating if you'll drive or fly, you're likely considering how you internalize the time and the cost of all of the components of both of the travel chains. How we internalize cost typically depends on our income and who's footing the bill for the trip. Right? You, might inter you might perceive the cost of flying to be rather high, or if your employer is paying for it, you might not perceive the cost at all. Right? And the way that we internalize time begins with our estimate for the time that each of the sort of links in the travel chain is going to take. But it particularly depends on the three components of the way we internalize time. And the first component is flexibility. Right? Driving offers the ultimate in flexibility. Get in your car and drive on your own schedule. Flying is the opposite. We're following someone else's schedule. Right? In contrast, air, uh, air travel offers the sort of ultimate in productivity. Uh, Dr. Milkman, just before, uh, before my talk, was telling me that she is productive from the moment she leaves the house to the moment she gets to her destination when she flies. She's on the phone in the security line, she's writing emails while she's waiting at the gate, she's working the entire time on the flight. Driving offers no such option. We are preoccupied with a rather mundane task of driving the entire trip. And anyone who has taken a flight or driven to a faraway destination knows that neither option offers predictability. We really don't know if there's going to be congestion, if there's going to be a road out. We really don't know if our flight is going to be on time uh, or if it's going to be canceled and we might never get there. We ne might never get there uh, to be, uh, at all. So how did you choose your mode, driving or flying, for your last trip? How did you internalize the time and the cost of both of your options? Well, if you chose to drive, you were not alone. 
Uh, Seventy-seven percent of trips from Philadelphia to Boston are taken in the car. Eighty-eight percent of trips from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. In general, as a society, we, we value the flexibility of the car and maybe the, the lower cost uh, over the productivity and the, the cost of flying. But now consider this. Now consider that outside of your house, you have an autonomous vehicle waiting to take you to your faraway destination. How would you choose your mode of travel? And would you choose the autonomous vehicle? You may have previously thought about how autonomous vehicle travel might change the way you move around the city. And I'm going to argue that autonomous vehicle travel is going to radically change the way we travel between cities. And this is because autonomous vehicles offer the ultimate in flexibility and productivity. Right? Leave for your trip whenever you want. Right? Have your vehicle when you, when you get there. Right? Depart from your destination whenever you want. But while you're doing that, you can be productive. You could work. You could sleep. You could turn around and play with your children if they're there. You can, you, can, um, you can be productive and flexible at the same time. In addition, if enough of us adopt autonomous vehicles, well, maybe we can platoon them on the highway, smoothing out congestion and thus reducing unpredictability. So now we have a mode that optimizes the three components of time. Okay? Well, if you can't wait to have an autonomous vehicle to take on your next intercity trip, we here at Penn are working very hard to make that vision a reality. Our Mobili Mobility 21 Transportation Research Center has been pioneering the development of autonomous vehicles. In 2007, Professor Dan Lee of Electrical and Systems Engineering built an autonomous vehicle, a very appropriately named Little Ben, and that vehicle competed the DARPA Urban Challenge. Uh, Professor Rahul Mangharam is developing a driver's license test for autonomous vehicles. And <laughs> at Carnegie Mellon University, our Mobility 21 transportation uh, uh, research partner, they've been developing autonomous vehicles and they can be seen driving around the streets of Pittsburgh. Most recently, they took our own Pennsylvania Secretary of Transportation, Leslie Richards, herself a Penn grad, out for a hands-free uh, hands drive around Pittsburgh. Well, if we have autonomous vehicles, how will they change the inter how will they change the intercity transportation network? Right. So let's consider the route network for airlines out of Philadelphia. These are all of the cities that we can travel to right now, nonstop from Philadelphia on a flight. Right. Philadelphia is what is known as a hub airport, which means that Passengers come into Philadelphia, they transfer flights, and they go on to their destination. And in fact, 50% of people who come through the Philadelphia airport are not coming to Philadelphia, and they don't live in Philadelphia. They're connecting, they're connecting through. So if those of us that are taking point-to-point -point trips between Philadelphia and another place, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, or Rochester. If those of us traveling point to point elect to travel on our autonomous vehicle because it's more, because it's more efficient, right? all of a sudden, the airline experiences a drop in demand on these three to 500 mile, mile flights. Passengers who are looking to connect, right? passengers who are looking to connect might find that now instead of five flights a day to Philadelphia, they have two because the demand wasn't there, because all of us traveling point to point have moved on to, have moved on to auto. The reduction in flights from the three to 500 mile distance could have a, a very big impact on our transportation system. So a traveler from Buffalo or Rochester might think, well, it's really inconvenient now to travel to Philadelphia. So instead, I'm gonna drive to Detroit, or I'm gonna dri drive to Boston and Philadelphia loses out on some transfer passengers. So while you might not have been affected by a canceling of some flights to Buffalo or Rochester, because you can get in your vehicle and drive from Philadelphia, now all of a sudden, when you want to go to San Francisco, there aren't as many flights, because those people from Rochester who want to go to San Francisco aren't coming through to Philadelphia. Another possibility is that people in, if people in smaller cities around Philadelphia 
Instead of flying to Philadelphia and connecting, they drive. And now, all of a sudden, that security line at Philadelphia has doubled in size. Right? And the number of people who come to Philadelphia airport to start their trip could, could double. This is not a problem that is unique to Philadelphia. Across the U.S., there are 1,000 routes that are 500 miles in length or shorter. And 37 of our top 70 airports have a majority of their routes are 500 miles or less. So this, is a, this is an issue that could change the air service network all across the U.S. So what do I think is the future of intercity transportation, in particular aviation with autonomous vehicles? Well, Robin Chase, the founder of Zipcar, talks about a future of, a future of urban transportation with autonomous vehicles characterized by heaven and hell. Heaven being that we all have uh, autonomous ride share, we're able to reclaim urban space because we no longer need parking because we can shuttle our vehicle to a far out parking area and we can take all this, the parking space on streets and we can make it urban space. Hell being that we all send our vehicles to run our errands and we never interact with the urban environment. Well, my heaven and hell for autonomous vehicles on intercity transportation are a few major airports across the U.S. being the only points of entry for air service. Huge security lines, huge congestion points around airports, uh, very, very long taxi lines for the aircraft, large, unpre big unpredictable, pre unpredictability in service, while airports in smaller cities lay completely underutilized, right? big disparities in the way infrastructure is used all across the U.S. So we are all making rational decisions for ourselves as we think about our intercity transportation choices. But are all of our rational transportation mode choice decisions, do they all, all add up to an intercity transportation system that is optimal for all? Thank you.